Thank you, Anna, and thanks to all of you for coming today. I'd like you to imagine a situation. Imagine this. You are um, enjoying a meal with your partner, and uh, one of you turns to the other and says, you know what? I've noticed I've put on some weight lately. I don't like the way it makes me feel. I don't like the way it makes me look. I want to be healthier. I want us to be healthier. That's a really smart thing to say, isn't it? Moreover, it's a message that we're getting from all sides. Newspaper reports, research studies, our doctors, even the White House is getting into the act with Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign. From every direction, we're getting the, the message that it'd be a very good thing for us all to take better care of our health, to eat right, and to move more. It's the right message, of course, but it's not like we're confused or uncertain about how to take care of ourselves. We all know how to take care of ourselves. By now, every headline, every research study makes more or less the same point. If we're going to be healthy and fit, we have to eat right, we have to move more. That's the formula. It's pretty simple. The science behind it is rock solid, and it's guaranteed to work for us. So what's the issue? The issue isn't figuring out what to do. If we know, more or less, what to do to be the healthier people we want to be, then what th the challenge for us all is figuring out how to make those healthy behaviors we know about actually become a part of our lives each and every day. By now, many of us have discovered that it's hard to be healthy. And let's face it, the world we live in doesn't make it any easier. We might have long commutes. We might have demanding jobs. We might be raising kids, taking care of an aging parent. We may not have the time and the energy we need to take care of ourselves. And we're surrounded by foods that are easily accessible, pretty inexpensive, but maybe not so healthy for us. Of course, there are reasonable solutions to all of these problems. There's diet plans. There's prepared foods. There's exercise programs and gym memberships. For some of us, there's even surgery. And what all these solutions have in common <coughs> is that they're directed towards us as individuals. They all kind of assume that if we want to make a change in our health, it's up to us, up to us independently of anyone else. But that's not always true. A lot of times, the health choices that we make are affected by the people around us. There might be somebody else in our lives, usually an intimate partner, who is, ha has a stake in the choices we make around our health. There's someone there who might be threatened if we want to change our appearance, who might be critical when we're trying to do something that's difficult for us, who might be resistant to paying for special foods, organic produce, or a gym membership, or who might just be insistent on their right to bake delicious desserts each and every weekend. You can see that all of the usual solutions that we typically hear about, virtually all of them, miss a crucial point. We can't separate our health from our relationships. We live social lives, and our health is a part of that life. We share a kitchen with somebody. We share a pantry with somebody. We eat meals with other people. We encourage or discourage one another from going to see a doctor. We have to schedule our exercise around our partner's exercise schedule. We all know that our health is part of our bodies. It's inside our bodies. But all of the habits that affect our health, all of the decisions that we're making that affect our health, those are a big part of our relationships. So when you're sitting with your partner and you say, you know what, I'm thinking I'd like to get healthier, I'd like to make a change, it couldn't be a smarter thing to do because you're talking to exactly the right person. There's nobody else who's more invested in your health aside from yourself. There's no one else who's in a better position to support you in making those health-related choices. There's no one else who's actually there in the very moments where you're making those decisions about your health. Now, you're telling your partner, or maybe your partner's telling you, that it's time to get moving. It's time to solve this problem. This next part of your conversation, that turns out to be pretty crucial. You and your partner care for each other. You love each other. You support each other in all kinds of ways. Of course you want to help each other. And you're motivated to help each other, too, because this is your health you're talking about, and it's not going to get better by itself. So what can we do? What can any of us do in that moment to give our partners the support they're going to need to make these difficult choices? What does effective support around health look like? And if we're the one that wants to make the change, how can we reach out to our partners and get from them the help we're going to need to move more and eat better and live healthier lives? A lot of people would say that uh, honesty is the right policy in relationships, right? That that's the way you communicate important things to your partner in a relationship. So let's say I'm the person who says, 
I'd like to lose a few pounds. I need to get exercising more. I need to start taking better care of myself. Maybe you could start with a little honesty. Yeah, you have gained a few pounds. I've noticed that too. Well, that sounds like the right thing to say, right? But it doesn't really have a supportive effect. It actually ends up sounding like criticism instead. Maybe you have to say something nicer to me, something a little more affirming or upbeat. I, maybe I need some reassurance. Honey, what are you talking about? You look beautiful. You look beautiful to me. There is no problem. It's nice to hear, right? Really nice to hear. But it totally ignores my issue. And it's certainly not going to motivate me to do anything. So I may need something tougher. I may need uh, a tough love approach. I need you to crack the whip. That's what I need. OK, you're serious? Fine. Tomorrow morning, 6 AM, we're going to go for a two-mile run. Tonight, I'm going to go to our cupboards and throw out all the carbs into the freezer, throw out the ice cream. From here on in, it's going to be low-fat diets and kale salad until we get this problem licked. Now, that could work, right? That is the kick in the seat of the pants that I would need to start doing the right things to take care of myself. But it sounds pretty harsh. It would be hard to sustain. And even if I could sustain it, I might not like my partner at the end of it. <laughs> so let me ask you, raise your hand if in your own relationships, in your own homes, when you've heard, when you've tried to talk about health issues, you've heard any of these kind of statements in your own home. A fair, a fair number of you. Now let me ask you a second question. Leave your hand up if you've heard those statements coming from your own mouth. <laughs> I mean, ouch. The good news is you're not alone. In our research, we've seen countless couples say exactly those words and worse. And we've seen that look of panic when partners want to help each other and realize they're not quite sure how to respond. And along the way in our research, we've we discovered something that really surprised us. Knowing how to help someone we love to become healthier, that doesn't come so naturally. The best way for two people in a relationship to support each other is not so obvious, especially when we're talking about something as personal as our health and as sensitive as our weight and our appearance. Why? Why should it be so hard for two people who love each other to uh, help each other do something that they both want? And that's so obviously good for both of them. That's the question that we've addressed a lot in our research over the last 20 years. Here's what we do. Uh, we've worked together for the last couple decades, and we study couples, often married couples, but not always, often young married couples. But we've studied relationships at all, of all stripes at all uh, levels and durations. For a lot of this work, what we ask the couples to do is to come into our research rooms. We give them a lot of questions while, we're with, while they're with us. But we also leave them alone to have interactions, to have uh, discussions that we record, but we're not there while they're having those discussions. What we ask them to do is talk about, to identify and talk about personal issues that they want to work on and change as individuals. Even though couples are allowed to talk about any personal goal in their life at all, most couples, the majority of our couples, end up talking about one thing and one thing only, and that's their health. They know from prior experience that it's not easy to eat right and move more on a regular basis. They routinely, all the time, turn to one another for the help and the encouragement and the advice and the support that they need to make these good habits really stick in their lives. Well, we've spent what seems like years of our lives in front of screens watching these videotapes. And going in, we expected that they were going to be pretty heartwarming. After all, what could be more loving? What could be more affectionate? than two people working together to live long and healthy lives into the future. That was our prediction. And it turns out we were completely wrong about our prediction. Uh, some couples were successful. And as we watched their tapes, we were really optimistic about them. And we could see that they were working together. They were teaming up. They were really joining forces to take care of one another. And, and as we studied those couples a year or two later, we could see that they were uh, looking healthy. They were telling us they were feeling good. And they had moved on to talk about other issues, ways of making other improvements in their lives. Unfortunately, those couples were in the minority. More often, we saw, what we saw in these tapes were couples who, even though they genuinely wanted to support each other's efforts, ended up getting in each other's way instead. What we found was that these conversations were far more emotional than they or we had ever expected. We saw couples returning to the same topics year after year without making progress, getting more and more frustrated with each other and with themselves. And we saw that what had once been minor health concerns were growing more and more serious with each passing year. 
at first we thought that if we were going to be able to help couples like this, that we would have to teach them all kinds of different complicated communication strategies to st steer their way through these problems. But as we watched the videotapes more and more, we realized that couples kept getting stuck in the same places over and over again. And we taught ourselves how to see these sticking points. And we realized that all of the traps really fell down to just three things. There were just three, three traps, three places where people were getting stuck. And what we want to do today is describe those three traps for you and to show you that once you can recognize these three traps, there's some pretty effective ways for avoiding them altogether. So let's start. Well, let's talk about the first trap. The first trap we see a lot in these videotapes, and maybe you see it a lot in your own lives. And it happens when one partner has decided to make a change, gets excited about maybe going to the gym or starting a new diet, and then reaches that first part where it starts to get hard. The enthusiasm is starting to wane, and you reach that, so, uh-oh, this is going to be harder than I thought. And on the videotapes, we see car partners turning to each other at that moment and saying, you know, I, I still want to do this, but boy, it's going to be tough. Just, you know, I'm used to having that bagel every morning, and I don't have, there's nothing that I have to replace it. And at the end of the day, getting to the gym is just getting really, really tired. I'm, I'm just too tired to do it. I want to stick with it, but I can tell I'm going to need some help. It's reasonable uh, for a person in a relationship to say that to their partner, to say that they need that, that help or to imply it. Lots of times the kind of response that we see following a statement like that goes something like this. That does seem rough, honey. I, I, I see what you're saying, but I'm not sure what this has to do with me. Like, why are you telling me this? Uh, you're the one chewing your own, your own food, and correct me if I'm wrong, I can't burn those calories for you. You have to lift the weights, right? So I get it. I hear what you're saying. I'm even sympathetic, and I'm not going to get in your way, but why are you telling me this exactly? The epitome of that kind of response was the one husband who said, puzzled, to his long-suffering wife, I don't get it. What does my eating a pizza have to do with your diet? <laughs> and it's a fair question, but the answer is a ton, so much. My eating a pizza greatly affects your diet because my eating a pizza affects the environment in which you're trying to make better choices for yourself. Yes, we chew our own food, but if you think about it, the choices that we make as individuals, if we're in a relationship, always and inevitably affect our partner's ability to eat right and move more. Think about it. If one partner does the shopping, if you're the person who does the shopping in your house, then you decide whether there's sugary treats in the pantry or whether you have a week's worth of fresh vegetables available to you. Your own inclination to exercise, that's gonna, you'll, you'll become a model for your partner about how much they're going to exercise. And your partner's choices about what they eat or how much they're exercising, those are choices that are going to affect you as well. There's some great research on this point that uh, really highlights the interdependence of both partners health choices when they're in a relationship. It's a, it's a diet study, and you've seen plenty of diet studies in the news, right, where there's, they take a group of people, they assign half of them to some kind of diet, like a low-carb diet or a low-fat diet, and they follow them over time to see if the people on the diet lose more weight, and usually they do, at least while they're on the diet. This one study did, was just like that. It was a study of some kind of diet, but it was a study of husbands. And what made it unique is that at the end of the study, they didn't just measure the husband's weight, they also measured their wives' weight. Now the wives weren't in the study. The wives weren't on the diet. But at the end of the study, the husbands who were on the diet lost weight, and their wives lost more weight too than the wives of the husbands who weren't on the diet. The wives lost more weight the more their husbands lost, even though they weren't on the diet. So the idea in this study is that good health habits spill over from one partner to the other. It's not hard to see why. When one person makes an active effort to be healthy and starts to make better choices, then it's far easier for the partner to start making better choices too. We can be that healthy person for our partner, and we can help our partner to become that healthy person. And when they become healthier, we become healthier as well. So what happens when couples recognize that they have an inevitable mutual influence over each other's health choices? One thing that becomes clear is that they can see that the small choice I make for, them, for myself, even the subtle, invisible decisions I make for myself, can have big effects on both of our abilities to lead healthier lives. In our tapes, we've seen lots of pretty good examples of this. So there was one woman who was finally feeling pretty good about her eating habits under control, but she 
was starting to realize that she needed to start exercising more. She needed to get moving, she needed to get on her feet, partly to maintain her uh, weight, main, uh, to maintain her weight, but also she wanted to burn off some stress after work. And uh, in, our, uh, in our lab, this was the first time that the husband had heard about this issue, and he said, honey, this isn't a hard problem. Let's do this. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I take care of the kids, I give them a bath, you come home for, uh, uh, after work, spend an hour, spend 90 minutes, go straight to the gym, do whatever it is you need to do, I'll be with the kids, things are fine. When you come home, everything will be set, everything will be great, we'll embrace you with open arms. That's not a hard thing to do, right? It's a simple idea, but it builds on this idea that small changes reverberate in our relationships. Th lots of times in situations like this we see people say, well, just exercise more. I don't know what it is you like to do. Just do more of it. Or why don't you just bring your sneakers to work and just go walk around? Like, I don't get it. But this guy could see that he was uniquely positioned to help his wife and to create a space where she could get on her feet, get moving on a regular basis, help herself feel good about taking control of her life, over her life, and everybody benefited in the process. So what if you want to get this kind of support, that kind of skillful support, but your partner is more like the guy who doesn't understand how his pizza affects your diet. Well, you have an opportunity to open your partner's eyes. A lot of times, our partners don't recognize, they just don't know about how they're influencing us. So we have a, a role to play in educating them and letting them know, actually, we are effective. Now, there's a constructive way to do this. So for example, uh, here's uh, one of our, our spouses said this. Um, and this is a direct quote. You know, I, I have trouble resisting cookies and chips. You know this, and I don't know if you know this, but those are like drugs in the pantry. Those are terrible. It's all I can do to resist eating those things. And when you eat them in front of me, oh my gosh, it's all I can do to not just grab the bag and start eating them myself. So if, if there's a way that we could solve this problem, I know you wanna help me, but if there's a way that, I don't know, if you could just eat them somewhere else, that would be such a huge help to me. Ch check out that kind of statement. It's not a criticism. No one's being blamed there. It's a disclosure. It's inviting your partner and giving your partner more options to help you, a partner who might well want to help you. Uh, that's the kind of thing that can get your partner's creative juices running. A lot of times our partners just want to say, oh, I didn't know. But now that I know, yeah, of course. I can take that outside. There's no reason why. I can still eat it, but I don't have to eat it in front of you. Those are the kind of perfect solutions that, might, that you create a space for them to spontaneously arise. So here's the point about our first trap. If you're in a relationship, you and your partner are affecting each other all the time. And smart couples know that healthy habits have a way of expanding in our relationships. Couples who take advantage of their mutual influence find all kinds of easy opportunities to make a big difference in each other's health. But they have to communicate what they need so that they can make those changes, even if they're small, make those healthy changes happen every day in their relationship. Let's move on to our second trap. And this is a trap we see all the time. And it happens when couples have been working perhaps or thinking about their health for a while and starting to get really frustrated. And what happens is that people get, uh, feel, start to feel a lot of emotional distress around their inability to make a health change. Uh, we see, even though our recordings are happening in our, our own research labs, people are still very emotional on these tapes. And we see, it, we see, see people very close to tears in a lot of cases. And when that happens, we hear things like this. Like, I'm going to quote you from one wife who, she just had her second child. She's a stay-at-home mom. And she was feeling overwhelmed. And she said, I don't know what to do. I am looking at the scale every day, and I'm seeing myself balloon. I don't want to become my mom. But I don't know how to help it, because I, it's, I'm so exhausted from the baby. I can barely get them food, let alone make myself another healthy meal. Getting to the gym, forget about it. I'm with the kids, I don't know where to put them, and I'm exhausted anyway. And so I'm just seeing myself get heavier and heavier, and I'm terrified that I'm gonna end up like my sister, and you know what happened to her. So unfortunately, the, the natural response to statements like that is to hear all of that overwhelming emotion, and the partner then tries to say things, usually through some kind of validation or reassurance, to make those feelings go away, right? To validate or reassure their partner. So sometimes it sounds kind of sweet. Partners will say things like, um, honey, I, there's nothing to worry about here. Don't worry. I still think you look great and give it time. This will work out. I know you can get this under control. But lots of times we hear, because the emotions are so strong, uh, lots of times we hear people be strident. We heard one husband who uh, was scolding his wife. He said, you think you're overweight? That's just wrong. It's simply not true. 
Whether you see it or not, you're attractive. You have nothing to worry about. You can see the trap. Those kind of spouses are, are uh, well-intentioned. They, they, they're moved by their partner's distress, and they want to erase that distress. They want it to go away, and they think that reassurance is the way to do it. Problem is, as you can kind of hear, the reassurance misses, misses the mark. And it misses the mark because it says, your opinion about yourself, your concerns, your anxieties, they're invalid. Well, that's not actually that reassuring. What we need in those moments is actually two things. And that's, that, and that's what people miss. What we need is, yes, <coughs> encouragement that we're still loved, encouragement that we're still attractive. Sure, we do need that. But at the same time, when we express distress like that, we need encouragement for the healthy person that we're trying to become. Providing both of these kinds of support at the same time, that can be kind of tricky. There can be a tension between wanting to help our partner change while also wanting to accept our partner the way he or she is right now. But whenever our partner is trying to do something hard, like lose weight, we have to understand both of these needs at the exact same time. There's some pretty great research on this. Uh, we've contributed to some of it. Some of I told you a moment ago that what we do in our labs is we videotape couples having these conversations about health and weight. The next thing we do is we follow those couples over the first years of their marriage or over the subsequent years of their relationship. And one of the things that we do every time we study them is we measure their weight. So we can assess who over the, the years of their relationship are gaining weight, who's maintaining their weight, and who's losing it. And we can relate those changes back to the kind of behaviors that couples were engaging in when we first saw them. Here's the surprising part. The couples that are the most reassuring, the most positive early on in the relationship actually gain more weight over time. Why would that be? Well, because that kind of reassurance really reduces your motivation to watch what you eat. In fact, the couples that were the most uh, healthy over time, the ones that were maintained or even lost weight, were the couples where, yes, they were positive, but that positivity was mixed with some real hard-headed responses from the partner. We heard partners in the healthy group say things like, look, I love you. That's a given. I'm not going to stop, and you know that. Still, your health matters. It matters to me a lot. And when it comes to your health, I am not going to let you off the hook. We heard one guy who is a, really a master of saying this kind of thing. And I'm going to read you a direct quote from what he said. His wife was really upset of, about having gained weight and, like many people, how hard it was to get back to the weight that she wanted to be at. And see if you can hear both kinds of support in this quote that I'm, I'm going to read. He said, baby, I hear what you're saying, and it breaks my heart to know that you see yourself th that way. It breaks my heart when you look in the mirror, you can't see the same fantastically attractive woman that I see in the mirror, that I see sitting in front of me right now. But if you feel your weight is not where you want it to be, then we have to solve that problem. We, you and me, have to solve that problem. How do we move forward? Check out how that guy threads the needle. Does he say she's wrong about her feelings? No. He, but does he also doesn't agree with them either. <laughs> so he's able to say in one sentence, yes, uh, I don't have the same opinion of you. I find you attractive. But the fact that you don't find yourself attractive, that's an independent problem. And it's still a problem that we can work on together. So what if you want to be healthy and your partner isn't coming forth with all the support that you really need to make change? It seems obvious, but we need to communicate that to our partner. And we need to communicate in a, that in a way that's not threatening. And specifically, what we need to communicate is that we need two kinds of support. We need to feel good and strong. People make changes not when they feel weak, but when they feel strong. We need our partners to feel strong so that they can make a change, but they also need motivation and encouragement so that they know that we know that they can make those changes. There's a way for us to kind of pull that out of our partners if we have to. And uh, you can say something uh, like this. You can say, it's very nice of you to say that you're attracted, and that, attracted to me still and that matters. Because your opinion matters to me more than anybody else's. But you know what? I still want to work on my weight. <laughs> it's still something that matters to me. And it's still something I could really use your help doing. If you could help me to steer away from the pasta and steer towards the, the, the celery, uh, I'd appreciate that. So that's another way of threading this same needle. And it speaks to the bigger point, that mutual understanding is crucial in our relationships. That's pretty obvious. But we're, when we're talking about sensitive issues like our health and our weight, there's a different kind of understanding that we need to achieve. And we need to help our partners feel good about who they are right now and also feel confident that they can make the changes that they need to make. There's a tension here, and we need to resolve that. And in order to do that, partners have to empathize with one another's needs. 
and they need to communicate those needs really clearly. There's one more trap that we see all the time, maybe you've experienced it, and we want to tell you about today. And it happens when one partner has been finally convinced that it's time to make a real change, it's time to either get moving or uh, eat right or make a change in our lifestyle, and the other partner isn't there yet. There's a difference of opinion that can lead to some really emotional disagreements that we've seen on these videotapes. And that a lot of the times they start when one person expresses frustration with the other, and it sounds something like this. Someone says, look, after all these years, I am finally ready to make a change. I'm finally ready to do it. Why aren't you? Don't you care about our health? Don't you care about me? The other person, you can hear the emotion there, the other person ends up feeling a little defensive. And often we hear people respond by saying things like this. Well, wait a minute here. Just because you want to do something doesn't mean I have to do the same thing, right? Why are you trying to change me? I don't want to give up soda. I don't want to give up french fries. I never signed up for all these cow salads anyway. <laughs> are, are you saying that you're not happy with the lives that we've been living? You can see the trap. And it happens when couples sort of disagree about values and then start wondering about each other. Uh, we're never going to be perfectly identical to our partners, especially around issues as value-laden as health issues. And even couples who are both committed to healthy lifestyles might still disagree completely about how quick to make a change and the specific kinds of changes that they're willing to make. So a little analysis helps us to see where all of that emotion is coming from. When you say something like, I want to lose weight, I want to look better, your partner might hear you saying something like, I want to look better for other people? Is that why you want to look better? You want to be attractive for other people? Or maybe even though that's what we're saying, they're hearing something like, are you saying there's something wrong with us? Or seriously, are you saying there's something wrong with me? When couples have these disagreements, what they're really arguing about at heart is timing. One partner says it's time to make a change and that change has to happen right now, immediately. The other partner doesn't see a need for an immediate change and so wonders, wait a minute, where's all this urgency coming from? But when you think about it, most couples actually share the same long-term goals. That's the trick. That's what you have to pay attention to when you want to steer clear of this third trap. In the long term, we all want pretty much the same thing for our health. We want to live a long, active, healthy life together. We want to raise our kids. We want to see our grandkids grow up. We want to uh, be healthy for a long, long time. So when couples remember their shared long-term goals, when they orient toward their shared long-term agenda, their short-term disagreements tend to evaporate. There's some really clever research that's pointed out just how powerful a short-term versus a long-term perspective can be. Uh, the way some of this work goes is they ask couples, uh, excuse me, individuals actually, to either focus on their short-term experiences or focus on their long-term health goals. And then people in both groups are exposed on the computer screen to a series of temptation words. Words like pizza and chocolate and ice cream. Things that are yummy but we know are not that good for us. And in both groups, people's emotional reactions to these words were measured. The people who had been asked to focus on their short-term immediate experiences reacted positively to the temptation words. And it makes sense. You see a pizza, you're like, oh yeah, that would really go down well right now. <laughs> you see ice cream, like, mm, I love that ice cream. But when people were asked to think about their long-term health goals, they had negative reactions to the same words. And that makes sense too. Because if you're thinking about the health, healthy person you want to be in the future, you just think about pizza, you're like, no, no, that is now an obstacle. That's an impediment to the healthy person that I want to be in the future. This study is telling us something really important about self-control and what affects our self-control. When we keep our long-term goals in mind, the difficult choices that we need to make today seem easier because our long-term goals remind us of the rewards of making those choices instead of the sacrifices that we need to make. The problem for most of us is we're not wired to think long-term. We're wired to think short-term. When junk food's in front of us, it's hard to keep our eyes on the prize because we always have our eyes on the fries. <laughs> There's only one area of our lives where we naturally think long term. And surprise, surprise, it's our relationships. In what other domain of our lives do we think about growing old together and even welcome it? In what other area of our lives do we say, oh, till death do us part, and that's somehow a good thing? 
uh, our long-term relationships activate our long-term goals like nothing else. And that's something that smart couples can capitalize on to motivate healthy, even difficult choices in the present. So this is the important pivot from short-term thinking, immediate thinking, to long-term thinking. We've seen a lot of good examples with this. We were watching one tape where the, um, the woman wanted uh, to cut down on uh, all the sodas she was drinking. And more than that, she really wanted her husband to cut back on all the sugary drinks he was drinking because he was drinking more than, than she was. And here's what she said. And you can see this, uh, this, uh, how you can avoid this trap. You can see exactly how she's doing it here. She said, I know you love your soda. I get that. And I agree that you look great and you're a healthy man right now. And that's great. But I'm not thinking about right now. I'm thinking about 10 or 20 years from now. And in 10, 10 or 20 years, I want us to be as healthy uh, then as we are right now. See what she does? That kind of partner frames a sacrifice, not as a sacrifice, but as an, as an investment in a shared long-term future. It's not a criticism, it's an invitation. It's an investment. Uh, she uses their long-term commitment to each other to motivate short-term changes that they can make today. So what if you're the one who wants to get healthy and your partner seems to be dragging their feet a little bit, or maybe you're just genuinely concerned that your partner isn't taking really good care of themselves? As usual, blame and criticism are not going to be the way to go. Instead, you want to build on something that you already have in your relationship. Take advantage of the long-term commitment that's already between you and your partner as a way of helping your partner to connect today's choices the hard things they need to do today with the healthier goals that are on the horizon for both of you. When in doubt, consider asking a question. It's always better than giving a command or a demand. So you could say something like this. Well, I get it. I'm ready to make a change. I think that's, that the time is now and you're not. That's okay. But let me ask you, how are you thinking about your long-term health? I know you want to be there for our grandchildren. You want to be active and healthy into long, a, 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 a healthy long, long-term old age. So what are you doing? What are you doing today to make that happen? The bottom line here is simple. Smart couples we see in our labs figure out a way to use their shared commitment to each other to a long-term future together as a way of uniting around their immediate health choices, the choices that they're making today, which are much harder. So let's go back to where we started. Imagine once again that you and your partner sitting there on the couch, chomping away, and one of you turns to the other and says, I'm not happy with our lifestyle. Not happy with what we eat, not happy with our level of exercise, I'm not happy with how I look. I want to get healthier. Well, it's not a surprise that that issue is going to come up. And we know, we know what the steps are that would help us get to our goals. We know what we have to do. But putting that advice into action is uh, really painfully, even impossibly difficult for many of us to do on a regular basis. We hope that now you can see that there are strengths within our relationship, three key strengths in our relationship that once you tap into them, you and your partner can team up to overcome the obstacles that may be preventing you from reaching your health goals. We're not saying it's easy. That's not what we're saying. But we are saying that if you recognize three things, that if you and your partner can educate each other about your mutual influence, that steers you clear of that first trap. And if you can generate mutual understanding so that uh, you're communicating with one another and you're deepening your mutual understanding of the challenges that you have and the, the support that you both need, that gets you out of the second trap. And if you dedicate yourself in the long term to, the, um, to the, the goals that you have on the horizon, the immediate choices that you're making today somehow become a little easier. And when you do these th three things, when you see the strengths that are invisible in all of our relationships, then all of that health advice that we are hearing about all the time can finally stick and uh, take hold in our daily lives. We'd like to leave you with one final observation. We've said to you through, for the last hour that a good, healthy relationship can be a springboard to uh, healthier bodies. It turns out that the reverse is also true. When we work on health in our relationship, the relationships get better as well. Uh, when couples recognize and take advantage of all the ways that their relationships can support their health, this is an almost inevitable side effect. The relationships get better and they stay better over time. So you can think about how that, that kind of thing might operate. When couples are expressing support for each other's health, they're showing concern for one another, for one another's health, and they're doing that in a sensitive and skillful way. They learn that they can depend on each other in ways that extend far beyond their health. 
when couples stay active, active together, they're discovering new things about each other. They're finding new opportunities for excitement and growth. Is it any wonder that love, which is arguably the most powerful force in any of our lives, is it any wonder that love and affection would emerge as the most powerful hope that we have for changing our eating habits so that we're eating right, getting us to move more, and enabling us to live long, healthy lives? Thanks for your attention today. We appreciate your coming. And we have about five, maybe five, six, seven minutes for questions if anyone has them. Have you ever come across experiences where one partner is getting healthy? Because you had mentioned examples where one partner is getting healthy or losing weight, and then you actually, or the husbands and you weighed the wives, and the wives had actually lost weight. Um, had you come across examples where the opposite was true, and, and under what did you come to conclusions as to why that might be? Like, where, say, one partner is getting healthy, and the other partner is getting less healthy. Yeah. Things that, like that absolutely happen. Uh, not quite as often, but they do happen. And w one of the reasons, one of the things we've seen sometimes is that when one partner makes a change, it can be threatening to the other partner. And the other partner can sometimes uh, wonder, again, you know, where is this change coming from? And feel like it's not just that you're changing yourself, but you're sort of trying to change our lifestyle. And the result can be, I'm going to now cling more tightly to that lifestyle. In fact, I want to prove a point, which is uh, I want you to now have to prove that you love me even if I'm not getting healthier. Because I don't want to have to get healthy to keep your love. So we get those kind of power dynamics. We've, we have seen that in tapes. And the question is how to get out of it. The way to get out of it is for the partner who's making a health change to, there is an, a reassurance that's appropriate in this situation, to say, hey, I want to get healthier not because I'm less satisfied with you, but because I'm less satisfied with me. And me getting healthier isn't a threat to you. And th that kind of reassurance can go a long way towards uh, diffusing that kind of tension. Well, my comment is my boyfriend recently encouraged me to step up my walk as I walk and we walk together. But he set up an application on my phone called Noon, N-O-O-O-M, walk. That way he can keep up with what I'm doing and I can keep up with what he's doing. He's been into this for a long time, but now I'm surpassing him with my steps. <laughs> but he has encouraged me to pick it up. So what I'm doing now is I'm really picking it up. I'm not just stepping. I'm actually stepping. You are moving. So yeah, I'm really moving. So if anyone is interested in that, you can go to N O O O M walk and you can keep a tally of your own steps that you're doing per day. So that's a and it's it called encourages movement. you to get more and more and more each day, more steps in. So this is That's very exciting. And the, the special twist that you and your partner put on it is to take advantage of the synergy that exists in your relationship. All he said was, hey, try this. It works for me. And you might day, like it too. Each day is very encouraging because I'm really setting it up. Each day I'm getting more and more. One day I had 10,000. Wow. And I don't keep up with it. He'll just say, hey, do you know how many you did say? I say, no. And now I'm just really happy. That's right. That's fantastic. Good for you. And you can take advantage of it. That's really fantastic. Congratulations. That's really great. But you can see that wasn't a huge change, right? That wasn't a massive change. That was a simple suggestion. Check out this cell phone. Check out this app on my smartphone. This worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you. I can help, I can help you figure out how to do that. And when that happens, he feels great. She feels great, and there is mutuality in that. They both end up sort of competing in the best possible way. And in your studies, um, the couples that were getting healthy um, together, would they more often do things together or separate or a little bit of both? Was there a predominance one way or the other? Great question. Really great question. Do you, uh, I, uh, what's great about it is it picks up directly on the previous comment which lots of people, uh, in our videotapes, lots of times we, there seems to be a subtle hint that we should be doing this the same way. We should be doing the same thing. Like if we have to exercise together, and that can sometimes be a barrier, often because schedules are difficult to mesh up and whatnot. But you just heard an example of somebody saying, 
we do totally separate, or we do the same thing at totally different times, but we can keep track of each other. So lots of times people um, think they need to do this together and often um, have trouble saying to their partner, look, I want to I wanna be separate from you. I want to do this in a way that's different from what you want to do, but I don't want that to be a threat to you. I still want you to feel good about that. So people have to work that out, but quite frequently we see people encouraging one another to go into different spheres and only occasionally maybe taking a walk together or doing some things together. There's a little difference between how couples negotiate togetherness versus independence around diet versus around exercise. Around exercise, it's, there's a lot uh, more space for people to say, you know what, I'm going to do some housework while you're exercising and then we'll trade off. Or I'll be with the kids while you're exercising. And we don't have to do the same things. Maybe I'll play basketball with friends while you do a class or treadmill at the gym. With diet, it's a little harder because we tend to eat socially. We tend to eat bar meals together with somebody. So there we, get, uh, we see more uh, issues about really what are we going to eat for dinner. It's harder to make two meals than to have two different exercise programs at the gym. So for my husband and I, I think one of the biggest problems is when one of us gets really gung-ho about an idea and the other one is like, that's great for you, but I don't want to give up X, Y, Z. Um, and that for us, I think, is the hardest, especially when, like, I have a protein bar that I love. It's a limited bar. And I think it's pretty healthy, and he's like, it's so processed. You have to stop eating them. And it's not a matter of him, you know, not wanting in the house because it's tempting because he doesn't even yeah, want them. Yeah, I see. It's just that... And then it just makes me nuts. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if this happens to anybody else. And it, it happens of course, to me. Of course, it, it happens crazy. all the time. So did you see that in your research? And it's the same thing when you were talking about working out. He loves to go on walks. I find them incredibly boring. <laughs> I just, you know, I actually teach a dance class right in this room yeah. at 1 o'clock today. Yeah. And then at 1230 on Thursday. So that's my exercise. Right, right, right. But I wouldn't get him in a dance class ever. Of course. So how did your, the people that you researched find balance? The people that we researched, the ones that did find balance, first of all, it was hard won. These are not easy things to negotiate at all. And so the, the tide rope that they had to walk is the tide rope that you're walking, which is on one hand saying, I, I love that you care about my health. I love that you're invested in your own health. So that's all good. I want to protect that. Now, uh, the, the harder message to weave into that is, and it's OK that we do it differently. As long as we both do it, it's OK that we do it differently. And I can, I'm going to make compromises, which is I'm going to go with you on some of those deadly boring walks some, sometimes, but not always. And maybe I'm going to ask you to make compromises too. And so th you recognize that there's a real tension there. But it sounds like you're applying a lot of skill towards you know, walking the tightrope. My question rolls back to the statistics you mentioned earlier, that if the um, husband goes on, loses weight, that the wife will lose more weight than the husband. No, no, excuse me, not more weight than husband, but she'll lose, the more he loses weight, the more she loses weight. Is it true the reverse? Outstanding, good question. And my sense, Tom, correct me, is that it is less true in the reverse. It has been studied in both directions, and there is a gender difference where uh, when she loses weight, he is less, that uh, uh, husbands affect their wives more than wives affect their husbands. And what is the <laughs> Uh, I, I'm hesitant to speculate too much, but what I am aware of, at least in, in the literature, there's an idea that in some households, uh, husbands have more, their preferences have more, con more say over what gets fed. So wives who are more responsible for food shopping and preparation uh, accommodate their husband's preferences more than husbands accommodate their wives' preferences. That's an average, may not be always be true, but that does seem to be true occasionally. So if that were true, then when husbands say, oh, I'm not going on a diet, she's like, OK, fine, I'll go with you. But if she says, I'm not going on a diet, he's like, well, you're on your own. More. That's just, that's, those are broad generalizations. But if you ask, that's the explanation that's in there. I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.